Hello, and thank you for checking out this message from Grace Church San Diego. Imagine a family or community so divided, they never wanted to see each other again. Views on race, politics, religion, these are just some of the things that divide our communities and even our homes. Blended is a series about how uncommon and incompatible people cannot just learn to live compatibly, but are called to meaningful fellowship together. We'd love to hear how Grace Church is affecting your life. Please send an email to info at gracesd.com with your story. Or if you'd like to help support our ministry financially, you can visit the website below so we can continue to help people find Christ and become His mature followers. Have you ever heard of the saying, don't put the cart before the horse? It means do things in the prescribed order, the order in which they're supposed to be done, right? Well, when me and my, my now wife were engaged, this was something that we just didn't feel like was too important to hold on to. And let me explain before you jump to any conclusions. Uh, I'll give you another one. How about this? Have you heard the plant pet family progression? If you can keep your fern alive, then you can talk about getting a dog. And if you can keep your dog alive, well, you can think about having a kid. Let me explain. As we were engaged, we were engaged for about a year and a half, and we were really fortunate because although I lived with my family and she lived with her family, we knew where we would be living once we were married. And we actually had access to that place already. So one day, about three months before we were married, my wife, Cassie, comes up to me and says, hey, baby, I'd like to move into the house a couple of months before. That way I can get it decorated and um, it'll be furnished so we don't have to worry about that. And I thought this was a great idea. I don't know if anybody here watches the show Fixer Upper, but she is my Joanna Gaines and she has a phenomenal eye for interior design. So I was like, this is a great idea. By the time we get married, everything's gonna be done. And so uh, we did it. We got her moved in, and everything was great for about a week. <laughs> After about a week, I come over one day, I knock on the door, and walk into the living room, and she's sitting there on the couch looking coy and bashful and batting her eyelids at me. And I'm like, what's going on, babe? And she proceeds to tell me that because she's living by herself and because she sleeps there alone, she'd like to get a dog to make her feel safe. And she says, you know, this would give me a lot of peace. This would give me company because you're not here. And we talked about it and decided this was a great idea. Keep in mind, I didn't have much of a choice because she made it about her safety, so I can't say no. <laughs> but I was actually excited about it. I was like, this is gonna be a cool experience and it will give her that company. So we made the decision. We told our families about it and we got a little bit of feedback, right? They were like, hey, don't put the cart before the horse. You need to get married before you can get a dog. But we didn't care. <laughs> um, yeah. So we got the dog. It was a really cool dog. He's about 80 pounds and loved to cuddle, but also looked like if he wanted to, he could, he could bite your face off, which I like, right? Because I'm like, give me uh, a dog that loves to snuggle and can also look rough. That's basically who I am. I'm a rough and tumble guy who likes to snuggle, you know? <laughs> So I was identifying with this dog. Well, we got the dog, and everything was great for about two weeks. After about two weeks, I come over again, knock on the door, walk into the living room. She and the dog are now sitting on the couch, looking coy and bashful and batting their eyelids at me. And uh, so I'm starting to sense some familiarity here. And I'm like, what's going on, baby? And she says, well, you know what? I've been thinking about it, and I think we need to get him a friend. <laughs> Yeah, so we did. We had two dogs before we ever got married. And what happened was really cool. I mean, dogs are pack animals. They need to be around either a person or another, another dog in order for them to be psychologically healthy. And that was exactly what happened. Our first dog was kind of lonely before, but with the second dog, they got along great. They formed a tight team. Wherever William would eat, Greg would eat. Wherever Greg would sleep, William would sleep. They played together, they ate together, and they became a team. This is kind of what I want to talk to us about today. So how are you all doing tonight? You excited to be here? Uh, thank you, online campus, all you guys out there, Facebook Live, thanks for checking us out. We're in a series of talks about what it means to be blended. The big idea is how incompatible people can live compatibly. 
And so we want to take that a step further today and look at how we can blend a team. We're going to be reading out of Mark chapter 10 today, verses 35 through 45. So if you want a Bible, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that one of the uh, ushers gets a Bible to you. I'll also have it on the screen, but I know some of us like to have uh, that physical copy in front of us. Before we go on, I want to define what I mean as a team, as I'll be using it in this message tonight. And a team is simply any group of people who comes together to achieve a common goal or for a common purpose. So if you're part of a family, you're part of a team. If you have a job, you're part of a team. If you play a sport, you're definitely part of a team. And if you're a Christ follower, you're part of a team. So we're all on teams, and honestly, we're probably all on multiple teams. This is, this is my team. This is my beautiful wife, Mrs. House, and this is our little boy, William. And if you're paying attention to the intro, you're probably wondering where the other dog is. And uh, he needed to hear this message, and he didn't make it in time. So <laughs> they had a conflict over control, and we had to find a new home for him. But... The thing about teams is teams are comprised of people, right? They're comprised of you and of me and of people in general, and people are inherently flawed. We have our baggage. We have our issues, and what that means is whenever there's a team, there will be conflict within the team. Now, conflict can arise for a bunch of different reasons, but some of the main ones are conflict over ideas. If we're in a team, whose idea are we going to go with? Are we going to follow your idea? Is it going to be my idea? Is it going to be their idea? It can create conflict. Another is conflict over control. Now, I don't have this issue because I love Jesus and I have a servant's heart, but um, my wife, she likes to control things. So let's all just pray for her really quickly, actually. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, another is conflict over personality. Now, sometimes personalities, for whatever reason, just don't blend, and that can create conflict and prevent a team from becoming blended. And finally, conflict over unequal workload. If you and I are supposed to be doing the same thing and you're doing twice as much of it as I am, that might cause conflict. And so as we go through this message today, as we see what Jesus has to say about it, I encourage you to keep in your mind the context of what teams you're in and how these might arise. And we'll look at how Jesus says we can overcome these issues. But before we dive in, will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, this beautiful day. Thank you for the blessing of living here in San Diego, for uh, the opportunity to come here to grace, for uh, your church, Lord, your people. And I pray that as we learn tonight about blending a team, you would help me to get out of the way, Lord, that you would speak through me and that you would reveal your truth to all of us tonight. We love you. We give you the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so Mark 10 35 through 45. Before I read, I want to I paint a picture of what's going on here. This is one of the Gospels, and at this point in the Gospel, by the time we get to chapter 10, Jesus is already nearing the end of his ministry. He's already been traveling for a couple of years, and the time of the crucifixion is rapidly approaching. As we pick up, we'll find that Jesus and the disciples are actually on their way back from Judea to Jerusalem. They've been traveling They've been doing the ministry, they've been working miracles, and now they are returning home. It's important to know that three times before we pick up, Jesus has told his disciples that he will go and die at the hands of men. And I read a lot of different reasons about this. Some commentaries think it's because Jesus was experiencing anxiety about what he knew was his impending death. Some think that maybe he was trying to communicate some truth to his disciples that they still didn't understand, and we'll see that in a moment. But for whatever reason, he's told them three times now, and literally ends in verse 34 right before we pick up. It's important that we know that because we'll see as we start in Mark 35 that um, this probably wasn't the best way for the disciples to follow up. It says, Mark 10:35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Have you ever asked an inappropriate question before? <laughs> right? Maybe it was uh, at an inappropriate time. Maybe it was just an inappropriate request. Well, uh, when I read this, it reminded me about a couple of weeks ago. Some of you may have heard that uh, Pastor Tim was recently diagnosed with bladder cancer. And 
the day that we found out was, it was, a, and it was an emotional day. I mean, we, uh, there was some tears. There was uh, a lot of worry. There was a little bit of catastrophizing. And so when my parents found out, they called me first. And they told me what was going on. And they told me that they would be telling the rest of my siblings. And so I was there for some of that. I think I took it the worst, to be honest with you. I'm kind of a crybaby. Whatever, maybe I'm just in touch with my emotions, you know? <laughs> but uh, finally, the time came to tell my younger brother, Malachi. And you have to realize, Malachi, Malachi has a wicked sense of humor. I mean, it runs in our family, but he is, like, on top of his game. And so Tim comes and uh, is talking with Malachi and says, hey, listen, the results came back, and um, I, I do have cancer. And you see Malachi's eyes just kind of get... Glassy. He's got that, that thousand yard stare as he's trying to process all of this information. And he's quiet for a while. And um, finally, he's able to speak. And he says, Well, can I have your car? <laughs> I know. That's an inappropriate question. Now, <clears throat> yeah. Fortunately, he did it for comedic relief. And, and we all laughed about that. And it was hilarious. But this is what's going on right here. This is. Jesus saying, hey, I have to go die at the hands of men for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And James and John follow it up with, okay, yeah, but can you do us a favor? <laughs> like he's not already. So we're going to call this the presumptuous request. And that's because that's exactly what it is. But that's not where it ends. It gets worse. We'll see in uh, 36 and 37 he says, what do you want me to do for you? This is Jesus speaking. You see, Jesus is a little too wise to be blindly obligated to do anything. It's like when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, can you do me a favor? Well, it depends on what it is, right? You're not going to just blindly obligate me. And Jesus is saying exactly that. He's saying, well, what do you want? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. James and John are literally asking for the number one and number two spots in Jesus' kingdom. But there's an issue, and that's that they don't understand what's happening. And Jesus is telling them that. He's saying, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? You see, James and John thought, and, and maybe the rest of the disciples as well, that Jesus was going to establish a physical, political kingdom in Jerusalem. They may have expected that he would die because he's been very clear about that, but they didn't understand that this wasn't going to be Jesus overthrowing Roman occupation and establishing a political kingdom. And so they thought that that's exactly what he was going to do, and when he did it, they wanted the number one and number two spots. They were trying to hook themselves up. And so Jesus, in this response, is saying, you don't understand what you're asking this cup and this baptism, they both represent death. Jesus is saying, can you drink this cup of death that I'm going to drink? And can you be baptized into the baptism of death that I will be? They don't understand. They say to him, we are able. They're like, Jesus, we got you, dude. We're your boys. They don't understand. They think that they can take this cup. And Jesus says to them, perhaps with an air of foreboding, you will. You will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. They would go on to die for the ministry, and that's what Jesus is saying. But even as such, it wouldn't be the same death. It wouldn't be the substitutionary death for sins. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus continues, and he says, But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And all Jesus is saying here is, Listen, those spots are already filled, and we're not changing it. But there's a problem now, because James and John have broken away from the team mentality. They've been traveling with these, this group of 12, these 12 disciples and Jesus for three years now. And they've been working towards common goals together, but not anymore. Now, James and John, realizing that this might be coming to an end, have decided to sneak up there and, and try and uh, hook themselves up. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. And so the problem is... The disciples find out about this. It says in the next verse, And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. 
And it makes sense, right? I mean, if, we, if we're a team and we've been together for three years now, working together, doing the ministry, working miracles, changing people's lives, building this unique bond, this family, and all of a sudden two of us, we find out, are trying to sneak around to do their own thing, indignation seems like the appropriate response. It's important to know that when you're in a team, the pursuit of power will always result in conflict. And Jesus is going to make this point right now. He uses the example of the Romans in the next verse, and we'll read that in just a moment. But you need to understand that at this time, Jerusalem was under Roman occupation. The, Ru the Romans ruled, and the Jews did not like the Romans. It was a conflict of culture. It was a conflict of interest, and they just didn't mesh well. And so Jesus says in the following verses, Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. This word ruler is the, the Greek word arko. It has to do with being first in position or authority. It means literally to have power because of your position. This word great ones is the word megas. This has to do with identity. This is inherent power. You have power because you're powerful. It reminds me of before I, I joined the army, I was, I was uh, sorry, before I came to Grace, I was in the army. And part of joining the military is you have to go to boot camp, right? At boot camp, there are drill sergeants, and it is their job to make your life miserable. And they're really good at it. So one day, I'm in boot camp. I'm just chilling in the bay, and uh, one of the drill sergeants calls me to the drill sergeant office. So I sprint over there, get to the door, lock up at the position of attention, knock three times, Private house requesting permission to enter. And I stand there for about a minute until they tell me to enter. So I walk through the doorway, go straight back to the position of attention, and wait to be addressed. It's probably four or five minutes before anybody speaks to me. And uh, finally they do. One of the drill sergeants turns and looks at me and just says, House, why are you so ugly? <laughs> right? I know. Rude. Rude. So, but at this point, I realize I'm literally just in there so that they can beat up on me. They're, they're just wanting to have fun, and I'm going to be the recipient of that fun. And so, I'm standing there, and I'm thinking to myself, if you're going to ask me a dumb question, I'm going to give you a dumb answer. And so I stand there, they ask me why I'm so ugly, and I say, well, Jules Sargent, I may be ugly, but I can dance. And I pop my chest, <laughs> right? I thought it was funny at the time. They didn't think it was very funny. And uh, I spent the next... 20 minutes in the push-up position singing R&B to them. So, but that's, that's what it means. You see, they had Arco over me. They had power because of their position. They didn't necessarily have Magos because there were some that I probably could have overpowered, but they had this power because of their position. And this word lorded over, it literally means to lord against or suppress. That was what was happening. And in hindsight, it's pretty funny but if you're trying to build a team, if you're literally trying to, to gra gather people and orient them towards a common goal, that doesn't work. And Magos here, it says that the great ones exercise authority. Now, these are the people who have inherent power. And this exercise authority, it means to power against, to suppress again. It does not create blended teams. And so if powering against and lording against doesn't blend a team, what does? Jesus gives us the answer, and we're going to call it the team paradox. A paradox is simply a statement that, that may at first seem to be contradictory, may not make sense, but in fact, it expresses a truth, and we'll see that right now. In the next verse, Jesus says, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. This word great is that same word megas. It has to do with being great, the identity or the quality of being great. This word first, first in position. Jesus is saying, if you want to be great, if you want to be the best in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. If you want to be first, if you want to be number one, you have to be a slave to all. And this word servant and this word slave, they're very particular words. They specifically mean people who are not paid for what they do, an unpaid servant, an unpaid slave. Jesus is saying, 
If you want this position, if you want this inherent greatness, you need to submit yourself to the needs of others and not expect anything in return. That is the servant's heart. I know that this is a lot of, uh, a lot of text. We've covered a lot of definitions, and this isn't easy to understand. So I'm going to give it to you like this. This is our team paradox, right? We have privilege and power up here, and we have the servant's heart down below it. Now, we can sit here on a Sunday, Sunday evening and look at this and say privilege and power is less. The servant's heart is more. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. But if we're honest, there may be something counterintuitive about that because we see that people up here have privilege and power, and we see that down below that is the servant's heart, and the servant's heart comes from servants, right? Servants spend most of their time serving people with privilege and power. And as humans, we naturally seek self-improvement, self-betterment, and self-advancement. So if you feel that way, you're not alone. We all struggle with that. And that's the beautiful thing about this, this paradox, is we have to choose. We have to intentionally switch our focus. It's not natural to see privilege and power as less. And it's certainly not natural to see serving and to have a servant's heart. And it's not easy to see that as being more. But we need to prayerfully consider how we can do that, how we can have that servant's heart. And you say, well, that's awesome, but how do we do it? That's not very specific. We have a couple ideas, a couple steps towards servanthood that can help you develop that mentality. The first one is to see others as better than yourself. This is easy in some instances. This isn't always difficult. Let's say you are out at a party chilling with not the San Diego Chargers, but let's say it's another sports team of professionals, and you're talking with them, and you're like, these people are awesome, right? They're better than me, and especially in the sports that they play. It is not hard to look up to somebody like that, to see them as better than you. But maybe, maybe it's not so easy to do that when we're stopped at a red light and somebody's knocking on our window with a cardboard sign and a cup. It has to be consistent. We have to develop this mentality. It's not always easy. And I'm not standing up here holier than you. This is something that I struggle with. And that's why we have to work through it. We have to pray. We have to ask God, give us your eyes. Help us to see people the way that you see people. The next thing that we can do is understand the value of our team. Now, this is something that excites me because I... I, and like I said at the beginning of the message, on staff with our First Impressions ministry. And that means I get to work with our First Impressions team. I come to, sun to church on Sunday every day so excited because I work with some of the most amazing people. I mean, when you come in, you see the, the greeters at the front door. You see the ushers. You see um, in the morning the parking attendants, the info people. These are all people who come and just love on people. That's what they want to do. They want to serve you. They want to create an amazing experience for you. They're committed to the team goal here at Grace Church, and they want to serve. They want to see that enacted. And I'm telling you, these are some of the most amazing people. I'm paid to be here. They're not paid to be here. This is just their commitment. You have to understand the value of your team. You see, you may be great at what you do, but you'll never be as great as a team is at what they do. It's important. And once you understand the value of your team, it's then so much easier to see them as better than yourself. The third thing that we can do is listen to your team. If you're a leader of a team, especially if you're a leader, you need to know you're still part of a team. You're not, uh, you're not directing them from some other position, some perched place looking down on them, no. You're one unit, and you are pushing in the same direction together. You need to be part of that team. You need to listen to that team, and you need to let that team hold you accountable. And you need to be able to hold them accountable. You need to listen, because if you don't listen, you end up in the same problem that James and John had. They stopped listening. They stopped communicating, and all of a sudden, the rest of their team is going this direction, returning to Jerusalem following Jesus, and James and John all of a sudden are veering off, thinking, oh, well, we're going to go pursue power. We're going to go pursue influence. And it creates this stretch, this, this conflict within the team. You need to be able to be accountable 
to your team. Finally, you need to give away power. I was trying to think of a way to, to explain this, and my wife gave me an awesome example. And some of you may know she's a teacher. She teaches kindergarten through second grade. And um, she is just one teacher, but she has about four aides and probably 15 or 16 students. Now, she is the head of that team, right? She's the leader. But if she was hoarding all the power, then it would then be her responsibility to make sure that everything's going right. And she can't monitor 15 kids at the same time, especially in that age range. I don't know if you've ever seen kindergarten through second grade, but they are crazy. So she needs to realize that she has AIDS, right? She needs to see them as better than herself. And certainly they are in their own aspects. After she's able to do that, she needs to understand the value of her team. She has four other AIDS. Finally, she needs to listen to them because these AIDS are working with those students. They may be working with two at a time, but they have a better idea of what those two need much more than she does across the room. And so after she realizes that, she needs to give them the power to do what they need to do. Don't hoard it for yourself. You cannot effectively lead a team if you are seeking to hoard it. It makes it far too easy to get distracted and try and pull the team in a different direction. What I love about this, this passage is Jesus has set up the problem, right? He's given us the conflict. He's shown us why it happened. And then he's given us tools to be able to overcome that. But what I think is beautiful is he doesn't stop there. He doesn't give us just the task and purpose. He then gives us the reason for why. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Understand this. We're talking about, we're talking about Jesus, God, the creator of the universe, the person who made everything, has all authority, all power, and he came to earth not to be served, but to serve. And if God, with all authority, is serving, how much more should we be serving? What authority do we have that God doesn't that allows us to be served rather than to serve? And he continues. It says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This word ransom is really interesting. In the Greek, in the New Testament, there are three words that can be translated as ransom or redeemed. The first one is agorazo. It simply means to buy in the marketplace. And it has... The, the context of a slave market. If you wanted a slave, you would go there and you would find the one you wanted and you would pay the agorazo or the ransom. But that's not the word Jesus uses here. The next word is ex agorazo. And the prefix ex in koine simply means to take out or to remove from. And so you can imagine it means to go and find the slave that you want, to pay the agorazo, to pay the ransom, and then to remove that slave from the marketplace. That's not the word Jesus used. The Greek word that Jesus used here is lutruo, and it takes it one step further. It means to go into the marketplace, to find the slave that you want, to pay the price, to remove that slave, and then to set it free. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, to find us to purchase us, to remove us from our slavery, and to set us free. There may be some of you in here tonight who are just checking this whole Jesus thing out, who say, well, I don't really know about this, but that sounds like something that I could get behind. That sounds like a team leader that I could follow. That sounds like somebody that I could, I could serve. And if that's you, I'm going to pray in just a moment. I'm not going to ask that you do anything weird. I'm going to ask that you close your eyes, that you repeat what I say.